Okay, 2820, picking it up in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, if you want to open to that portion of God's Word. Um, this is a, a chapter that, uh, in which Paul is talking about, prior to this, our liberty in Christ and uh, our freedom in Christ. And he concludes it in this section. He's, he's talking about the freedom that we have to serve Christ and the importance of that service. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 16 through 18. What does Paul say to the Corinthians regarding uh, this whole responsibility of proclaiming the gospel? Uh, and so what he says to the Corinthians uh, is that the proclamation of the gospel is accomplished through proclamation. <laughs> that's, that's, that's nothing super profound, but it is instructive. So notice uh, three times in these verses where he uses the expression, preach the gospel, uh, preach the gospel, preach the gospel. Uh, that's what he's talking about. He says, that is what God has laid upon my heart, but that's what God has called me to. And as witnesses of Christ, that's what we're all called to. Now, Paul understood with specificity uh, how God wanted to engage him in the proclamation of the gospel. But he's saying that as, as it pertains to freedom that we possess in Christ Jesus, we we need to use that freedom to proclaim the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> and he says, I do it so that I may present Christ, the gospel of Christ, without charge, that I may not abuse my authority um, in the gospel. So he was, his paramount concern and his paramount focus was that the gospel is clearly presented and that it is done in such a way that people would not have a credible basis to throw allegations at him and accusations at him. Now, they did that. <laughs> Regardless of whether or not uh, he was credible, and he was credible, it, that doesn't stop people from throwing accusations. Um, that's just a general thing to learn in life and following Christ. Here we're talking about Paul in particular in the gospel. But listen. It doesn't matter who the believer is and how thoroughly they follow Christ. Um, you're always going to have those who make accusations. The more you're out, uh, quote, in the public eye, uh, serving the Lord, there's, the accusations are going to come. Be they few, be they many. That can't be stopped. But what Paul is saying is, that the way he went about proclaiming the gospel, uh, in this instance, he did, he did it when he says without charge. Um, he didn't expect any financial return from the church in Corinth, even though he had every biblical basis to do so. But he understood that uh, it was important in that context not to do that because that would... Uh, detract from the, the presentation of the gospel. Not him explaining it, but them hearing it. In other words, but the point is proclamation. I'll continue on in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is a chapter that deals with what? The resurrection. <clears throat> and so Paul in this chapter says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you, I like that. that, that choice of words, I declare, not in the sense of being in someone's face, but today we typically say, uh, share the gospel. And okay, that's fine, but I, I like this word, that, that's a little, uh, that, that's more um, descriptive. Paul wasn't there simply to to share, he was there to declare. And maybe that is a distinction without a difference. Maybe that doesn't stand out to you. But I look at that and I say, yes, the way Paul approached it was, I'm here to declare truth. 
And obviously in declaring truth, he was sharing truth. But it's, it's a little bit stronger of a word to me. Uh, not stronger in a sense of attitude, but stronger in a sense of purpose. So I, I declare to you the gospel which I preached, I proclaimed. So that, that's consistent. Paul, to be a witness of Jesus Christ, to, to communicate the gospel, we've got to talk. We've got to talk. No matter what generation, what century we live in, it requires the witnesses to talk, to, to use the God-given capacities, the God-given organs of communication to communicate, rather than relying strictly on passive forms of communication where we're not actually talking to people. <laughs> so that's an important, I think that's an important truth that we just keep coming back to. Why? Because the scriptures keep coming back to it. And uh, hopefully, as we continue to go through Scripture, it just sinks in deeper that, you know, I've got to be talking to people and explaining the gospel to them. Uh, yes, use some passive means, but I, I've got to be engaged. I mean, I've got to use this mouth that God's given me. I've got to use this brain that God's given me. I've got to use whatever capacities God's given me to communicate and, and use them for the gospel. And he says, uh, uh, so I, I, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you and in which you stand, um, and this gospel by which you are saved, uh, and that you hold fast that word which I preach to you. Okay? So Paul clearly communicated that. And I'm not going to read through all of these verses um, this morning, but uh, he explains the, the core truths of the gospel. He lays them out here, that, that these are the core truths, and then you explain these truths um, as it pertains to the gospel. Uh, and so he wraps it up in verse 11 with the, phrase, with the statement, So we proclaimed... Preach, proclaim, and so you what? That's the process in a very short statement. Proclaim, proclamation, belief. Now, is, is obviously it's biblical, but my mind goes immediately to Romans in chapter 10. For faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so we, we have the... Uh, proclamation, that's, that's how people hear. We proclaim, we communicate. And as they hear the Word of God, the Spirit of God uses the Word of God proclaimed, and through that Word of God, faith is generated, belief is generated. So it requires a proclamation of God's Word. So witnessing is all about proclaiming the gospel, which means we need to have a clear grasp on the gospel. We go on to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. So now we're in the second letter to the Corinthians. Uh, chapter 1, I believe. I shouldn't say believe. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19. So again, the phrase, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you. Again, proclamation. Uh, by us. So here's a team. Here's a plural. Uh, by us, by me, Silvanus and Timothy, uh, was not yes and no, but it was in him, yes. And so here's Paul, Silvanus, Timothy, working together as a team as they traveled to the very cities that God led them to, and they proclaimed the gospel. And uh, they said, we, we did it with clarity. We did it with uh, definition. It was not yes and no, not perhaps this, perhaps that, could be this, could be the other. There was clarity, it was definite, but in him it was yes. That's what he's saying there. Here's, here's the truth. Here's what God has revealed. This is what God has accomplished in Jesus Christ, God the Son, who died on our behalf and was raised again for our justification. And you need to, put, you need to repent 
and you need to put your faith in Christ Jesus. Uh, so it was clear, it was definitive uh, in the presentation, in the communication of it. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, a door was opened to me by the Lord. So he arrived in Troas, again, to proclaim the gospel, but a door was opened to him. In, in witnessing for Christ, God opens doors. We get engaged with talking to people about Christ. And in that process, God opens doors. So there's a dynamic going on here that as we engage in the process of proclaiming Christ, God opens doors. And Paul talked about that. A door was opened to me, an opportunity. It was evident. This, this, this is what God put us here for, and here's the opportunity in front of us. So in witnessing, the more we engage in it, the more opportunity is opened for us. That's a great blessing. It's the opportunity to proclaim. God does the work of bringing people to faith in Christ. Our part is the clear proclamation of the gospel. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 14 to 16. Paul says, For we are not overextending ourselves as though our authority did not extend to you, for it was to you that we came with the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things beyond measure, that is, in other men's labors, but having hope that or expectation that your faith is increased, we shall be greatly enlarged by you in our spirit to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. So now he's getting the, the Corinthians involved in this whole process. And he said, we, we were among you, we preached the gospel, you've come to faith in Christ, and, and we're still going to regions that are yet beyond you, but you have a part in this process, and, and you are to be engaged in this process too. So Paul didn't, uh, God didn't intend to use Paul and Sylvanus and Timothy to preach the gospel, and then this initial group of believers in Corinth, that's all there is. The, the understanding is, once there's a, a group of believers that God has brought into existence in Corinth or any other city, then as they are taught and trained and equipped, they in turn begin to uh, proclaim the gospel more fully in that region. And Paul and his team, they understood their, their call and their direction of God was always to be pushing further, pushing further. So they took whatever time was necessary in any given city to proclaim the gospel, equip the believers as much as they could before they were run out of town, <laughs> and, uh, which was not uncommon. And then move on to the next. Always pushing forward, but always proclaiming the gospel. What's that? Uh, they, were, they were always in the mix. So it wasn't strictly Jewish unbelievers. There was a number of Jews who did come to Christ, and that's what really stirred him up, because they would go into the synagogue, uh, if there was a synagogue in the city, and proclaim Christ there uh, by invitation. And as some of the Jewish uh, uh, people in that synagogue uh, believed and put their faith in Christ and embraced Jesus Christ as Messiah, those who did not believe, who heard the same message but refused to believe, they became angry, and angry enough to where they agitated not only among themselves, but they agitated among the Gentile authorities in the city, and so they were always in the mix, but it wasn't limited to um, unbelieving Jews. And, and so they... Uh, they were always in the mix of seeking to move Paul on or kill him. Uh, there were those who weren't content with the thought of just, hey, as long as you're not here, that's fine. There were those who had the mindset of, as long as you're not alive, and we're going to help with that. So that, that was not the sole context of Paul's ministry, as he proclaimed the gospel in various cities, but it wasn't an uncommon experience for him. And so, uh, 
Jesus knew, understood when he said, you know, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. And they didn't hate Jesus because of the good works he did. They didn't hate Jesus because of the people he healed. Uh, of the miracles that he accomplished beyond healing. Uh, they hated him because of his message. If he would have done those things minus the message, it'd be good. And Jesus said, as my disciples, as my witnesses, if they hated me, understand this. From the beginning, they're going to hate you. And they're going to hate you because of the message. And so if we kind of uh, disconnect ourselves from the message, then we're not going to have the hatred or the opposition or the accusations or the ridicule. But if we're married to that message, we are going to experience at various times some levels of that may be very subtle, may be very open. But that message, the message of the gospel, is offensive because it confronts the reality of our sinfulness. And we don't like that. We hate that. It's more than, I don't like that. See, I don't like Ohio State fans crowing about I don't hate them. I'm not going to go, if I see one, if I see somebody wearing an Ohio State shirt or jacket or hat, I'm not going to rip it off of them and try to beat them up. And, you know, I don't hate them. <laughs> Depends on the fan. <laughs> But, so, so, you know, just in, on a very superficial level, you know, I, it, it has to be superficial. If it goes beyond superficial, I've got a problem. <laughs> I, you know, Ohio State, they're a rivalry. Don't like them, okay. Those of you who understand rivalries, you understand that. that that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about actual hatred. To where they want to do you harm whether it's to harm your reputation, harm your character, harm you physically, harm you financially. They want to do you harm because of the message. And they make it clear that if you, and it's, they don't state it this way, but it becomes very clear. Hey, if you back off the message, we'll back off the opposition. That's why Jesus said, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. And they hate me because of the message. And that message confronts man's sinfulness. And we hate to have our sinfulness confronted. Paul experienced that. And, and you know, we just happened to live in a country that was founded upon religious liberty and religious freedom. And so there, there's, in our DNA as a country, uh, there is that reality. But it's not always going to be that way. I believe, in my opinion, I think that our country not only is in the process of changing, I think ultimately um, if, if people who have a very, um, a very different way of thinking about America and about freedom and about what's morally right and morally wrong, not, not strictly on a, a biblical framework, but morally right, morally right, morally wrong in the sense of what they think is morally right, morally wrong. I, I foresee a day, not anytime soon, but I foresee a day in which because of the thinking of the people in our American culture changes, our nation changes and there becomes more and more 
aggressive, open hostility to the message of the gospel. Um, that's not here yet. But when that arrives, the question then becomes, um, and then an issue that we have to work through is, do I somewhat begin to disconnect from that message, or do I seek to modify that message so that... Um, on the one hand, there's less opposition, but on the other hand, it, it gives me, you know, here's, here's the way that the thinking would go, it gives me more opportunity <laughs> to hear a more generalized message, a generalized message that really doesn't confront the reality of man's sinfulness and thus the need of the gospel, that the need of the Savior. Anyway, it was the Jews. You asked the question and I went <coughs> off on a, tirade <laughs> not a tirade but a long explanation and so I, I hope that helped you understand but regardless they knew that was part of the territory not necessarily in every situation on every occasion but they knew that was going to be part of the reality of communicating the gospel I mean Think about it. In any of these cities where this happened, the Jews didn't have opposition. And those who followed the various pagan deities, they didn't have opposition. But when those who know Christ as Lord and Savior and are proclaiming the gospel show up in these cities where Christ has not been proclaimed, and they begin to proclaim the gospel, and people listen, and people come to faith in Christ, and they see that there's an impact upon the population. They receive opposition. <laughs> Second Corinthians 11, 7 through 9. Did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? So there again, he's talking about this dynamic of, of saying, I, I had no financial obligation that I expected of you. Now to the Corinthians, he lets it be known clearly. There, there is not only biblical basis for doing that, what I am doing is an exception in this situation because my greatest commitment and concern is the gospel and i don't want to be doing anything that <clears throat> in my estimation is going to diminish your hearing and reception of the gospel and one of those for for whatever reason i don't know the context well enough going that far back in history to know exactly what paul's talking about here but obviously there the the people in corinth um had some <clears throat> Ideas and thinking about those involved in religion, which I can understand, uh, that they're in it for the money. You look at the temples and the pagan temples and how they operated, which was where they, that's where they hung out. And that was all, uh, uh, I shouldn't say all, but that, that was a definite part of the religious system was through that. That's how the priests became wealthy, the temple became, you know, a lot of money there at, in the system. And so... Paul wanted, perhaps among other things, to communicate. This isn't just another religion similar to the religions you've been exposed to. And one of the obvious key ways of, of demonstrating that was, I'm not taking any money from you guys. Paul was a tent maker as much as he needed to be, which was often. So he did extra work to generate income for he and his ministry team. His ministry team, they worked together as tent makers for the purpose of proclaiming the gospel. But he let the Corinthians know that as you develop as a local church, there is the need and responsibility for you to be paying those who are elders among you and those who labor well in word and doctrine. So even though Paul did not require that or expect that, he wanted them to understand that moving forward, this is part of what it means to be a local church. Okay? <clears throat> so he says, can't take that 
And, and when he says, I robbed other churches, does that mean he got into the offerings? <laughs> you understand what he means by that, right? <laughs> other churches were supporting him. While he doing ministry in Corinth. That's what he means. And I was present with you, and one of those churches was Philippi. Okay? And when I was present with you and in need... I was a burden to no one. I had needs. We had needs. But we, we determined that even though that was present, we would not be a burden to anyone. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia, another part of Greece, supplied. And in everything I kept myself from being burdensome to you, and so I will keep myself so that was important in that particular scenario. So this teaches us that we need to be attuned to the, the people that we are proclaiming the gospel among. And if there's some adjustments that we need to make in these kind of areas, not to the gospel, then uh, make those adjustments. Galatians. So now we move to the book of Galatians. And again, you see this word preach or proclaim. So preach here again. I, I keep saying this because I think it's important to just come back to this every time because this word preach in our, in our culture um, and in our background is somebody who stands behind a piece of furniture like this or nowadays they have the glass pulpits or the little podium uh, but anyway, the idea is you got a guy in front of a group of people and he's the preacher and he does the preaching and that's what preaching is. Well, that's true, but that is a very limited, uh, restricted understanding of preaching as it's talked about in the New Testament. So if we bring that way of thinking to this English word preach as we read it in the New Testament, we're not going to have a clear understanding at all of what is meant by this word preach. It means proclaim, and it's not limited to somebody who is looked upon as a preacher. So we need to see it well beyond that, because obviously um, Paul is an apostle. He, he didn't have a piece of furniture to stand behind, and, you know, it wasn't a gathered congregation, typically, other than in a synagogue. So preaching here means, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> proclaim. So just proclaiming. And when we're talking to people, we're proclaiming. We're communicating. Yes. Yes. But people still will argue. <laughs> well, they argued with Paul, but you're right. It's a proclamation. <clears throat> it's not just additional information. This is information. Proclamation communicates. This is information that you need to respond to in one way or another. But anyway, he says to the Galatians, and this is very important, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel, then what we've preached, if anyone preaches the gospel which was preached, proclaim, proclaim, proclaim. Now, <clears throat> this is significant. This is early on in Paul's ministry. And, and I know we don't have a map up here, but you have Israel and Jerusalem down here. So just imagine with me, okay? you got your imagination stations going. And so down here is Jerusalem. Over here is the Mediterranean Sea. You come up along here, and then you start winding over this way. So this is what was called Asia Minor, and it's today modern-day Turkey. Okay, so those of you who have a good uh, geographical understanding of the world, you can kind of picture that. If you don't, you're just kind of floating out there saying, He's using names of countries that I'm familiar with, but I have no idea where it's at. 
But modern-day Turkey and the northern regions of modern-day Turkey was an extensive area that at that time was called Galatia. And so when he says the churches of Galatia, it's talking about whatever number of churches that were up and operating in this region of Galatia. So it's a significant amount of area. And already the gospel is being distorted. Error that is uncorrected becomes error entrenched. And when it comes to the gospel, Paul wasn't saying, you know, however you want to conceive of the gospel, make it your message, go out there and proclaim it. There, there's no customization to the gospel. That's one of our current terms is customizing any number of things. And, you know, that's fine for a number of applications, but when it comes to the word of God, we don't customize the word of God. The gospel is central to the word of God. And it was critical that Paul make it be known that there can be no deviation from the gospel. No deviation. You can't subtract from it. That's error. And you can't add to it. That's error. And the churches of Galatia had been infected by some false teachers, obviously with a Jewish background, who were adding to the gospel. They were affirming the essence of the gospel, but they were adding to it. And this error had to be addressed. Because if it was not addressed, then it would become entrenched and then embraced. And so Paul says, you know what we proclaim to you, which one says there was clear proclamation. It says there was extensive proclamation. They, they didn't leave any aspect of the truth of the gospel uncommunicated, unexplained to the churches, the, those who comprise the churches of Galatia. So the message was clearly proclaimed, clearly delivered, and they were charged with the responsibility then of proclaiming that same message, continuing to proclaim that message in that area as the apostle and his team moved on. But they weren't. And so Paul says, I want you to understand that the gospel is so critically important that it be communicated clearly and accurately as God has given it that if we, that, that um, if there's any other gospel that is preached other than the one that we have preached, let that man be accursed. But it came through proclamation. So we need to be sure that we are clearly understanding and clearly proclaiming the gospel. It's vital. And listen, since the gospel was attacked not only in the very first century, but attacked during the ministry of the apostles. Just because Paul wrote Galatians, it didn't mean that everybody who uh, Satan and, and all of his emissaries, spiritual and human, didn't say, oh man, this he, he wiped us out because he wrote this book and therefore we can't change the message any. <laughs> Every century, there are always attacks on the gospel. Because this is the message. So it's vital that, that we clearly understand the gospel and understand that it's not to be subtracted from or added to. But it was preached. <clears throat> Verses 15 and 16. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace... So Paul came to understand that he's at this point in life because this was God's plan for him, as it is for all of us. God has a plan for all of us that, that begins, as Paul speaks of here, 
We just don't know about it until we come to faith in Christ. Then we begin to see the dots and connect the dots. And that's what Paul had done here. And he understood it's all by God's grace. To reveal his son in me that I might preach him. He says that's, that's what God has called me to do is preach him, preach Christ among the Gentiles. He said that's, that's my calling. I'm a redeemed Jew who is called by God to take the message of Christ and the gospel of Christ to the Gentiles. So that, that's very clear understanding and specificity. And he says, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. Galatians chapter 1, but they were hearing only, he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith. Which he once tried to destroy. But he said, he said that that's, that's what was known about Paul. Now he's, he's proclaiming the very thing that he sought to destroy. So then a little bit of his history. After 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation. In other words, God directed me. Don't, don't try to put anything too mystical into this word revelation. It just means God revealed. God made known to me. And communicated to them the gospel which I preach. So he said, that's what I did. I communicated to them the gospel. And that's what I proclaim. And I proclaim it among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Chapter 2. But on the contrary, watch this. When they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised, which is who? Who are the uncircumcised? Gentiles. Had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised, which is Jews, was to Peter. So there's some specificity. Just take note of that. Paul says, hey, as, an, as apostles, God has called us to particular uh, people. And he identifies Peter and himself here, but he says, uh, I was called to the Gentiles, and Peter is called what? To the Jews. That doesn't mean that he only preached to the Jews, but that was his primary focus. For he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised, the Jews also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. Same God, same message, different groups of people. And when, he, when, when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be the pillars, perceived that grace had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. And so several of the apostles, their focus was on to the Jew first, so they went to the Jews. Again, not exclusively, but that was their primary focus. Just as says Paul, he didn't limit himself only to Gentiles. He didn't say, what's your name? And you say, Simon Rosenstein. Oh, that tells me you're a Jew. I'm not going to take the gospel to you. <laughs> what's your name? Mark Clay. Oh, you're clearly a Gentile. I'm going to talk to you. <laughs> it wasn't that. But he understood that his focus was to be taking this message to the Gentiles. And Jews were in the mix, but his focus was the Gentiles. And Peter, his focus was primarily the Jews, but he also preached to Gentiles as well. But it's understanding that specificity, okay? Galatians chapter 4, you know that because of physical infirmity, I preach the gospel to you first. Uh, so again, proclamation. And so Galatians is an awesome book. They're all awesome, really. But what I wanted is just to simply glean from that is that um, the gospel cannot be added to or subtracted from. Paul had clearly and extensively, thoroughly communicated the gospel through proclamation, whether that was through preaching like we think of or teaching, but he had thoroughly communicated it, which tells us that as we are engaged with the gospel, we need to be thoroughly communicating it as we do so. Because that's what gets passed on, all right? But proclamation. Ephesians. So now we're in, in the 
at the church in Ephesus, chapter 6, at the end of the, the letter. And Paul says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me that what? Utterance, which is talking. Utterance may be given to me. He says, pray for me <laughs> that utterance will be given to me. That's an effective way for us to pray as far as being witnesses. We all need to pray that, that we will have, that the utterance will be given to us. Opportunity, but also then boldness in that opportunity. That what? That utterance may give, that I may do what? Open my mouth. We'll get to that. But open my mouth. Proclaim. Communicate. Things that we are passionate about it's not difficult for us to open our mouth. That's just an observation, okay? And I'm not going to make any commentary upon what we are passionate about or not passionate about. This is just the basic truth. Whatever we are passionate about, we will talk about. We want to talk about. We hope that there's opportunity to talk about. But the gospel is a different passion. Because Paul had a great passion for the gospel, but with married with the gospel. And this passion is great spiritual struggle. And that is a reality that doesn't come with other passions. This is a spiritual struggle in the communication of the gospel. So while Paul had this great passion, it wasn't always easy for him to open his mouth because after you have been really hated and really uh, run out of town, when you have had people who literally not only made the attempt to kill you, but thought they had because they left you for dead after they stoned you, and that happened more than once, they left him for dead. We got him. He's done. So it's not just the desire, and it's not just an attempt. It's the carrying through on it. And Paul was human. We tend to take the individuals of the Bible and, and sometimes and, and just think that if Paul went into every town and said, throw anything you got at me, I am an apostle, and I am. I'm, not a, I'm super spiritual. I mean, we don't think of it in those terms, but we, we tend to get uh, this perception about the first century believers, even the apostles, that they were so pumped up about Jesus Christ and the gospel and the word of God and that it didn't matter what the attitude of people was, what their reaction was, what they did to them, they're just going to keep on going and it, you know, they could just plow right through it. That's not reality. And, and we see that in statements like this. Paul says, that's my passion. Pray that God gives me utterance and that with that utterance I may open my mouth because I know when I open my mouth, I know the message is going to come out. And that message among some is going to generate intense opposition and hatred. That I may open my mouth with what, David? Boldness, boldly. To make known the mystery of the gospel. Witnessing isn't an easy communication every time. Sometimes it flows very easily. So we've got to keep that in mind, but we don't want to think that that's the way that it is even typically necessarily. It is a spiritual battle because of the truth contained in the gospel. So he says that I may make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, 
that I may what? Speak boldly. Now watch this. What's this last, that last phrase? As I ought to speak. That's what Paul says. Pray for me this way. Yes, the great Apostle Paul. Yes, the leader of the gospel to the Gentiles. I need prayer. That I'll open my mouth and that I will talk. Then I will speak boldly as I ought to speak. What was he communicating to everyone? Communicating that that's a reality for all of us. And that's how we can pray for each other. Lord, help us to open our mouth as you open those doors. Help us to boldly and clearly communicate our Lord Jesus Christ. Then we'll stop there. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time we've had together in your word. And we just want to be equipped, Lord. And we do pray for that boldness that we so desperately need. Um, And it's not a one-time um, splash of boldness. It's a continual need. And Father, um, with that to uh, clearly communicate this blessed uh, gospel which we have each embraced by faith in Christ Jesus and communicate it to those that you've placed in our lives. And uh, Father, we uh, just are grateful for this time together in your word today. Strengthen us with it. And help us to pray for one another. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.